thank you guys for having me once again. Uh, it's really just a privilege to be a part of this. I think the SDSF does such an amazing job, uh, how you connect the world, honestly, in, in education, but also just sort of your your stewardship of, uh, of um, so many uh, things spine, and uh, it, it spans all, all realms, and to be honored uh, to be invited to talk about robotics, and I think I give the other talk on osteoporosis is just, it's a, it's a highlight of my year, to be honest, so I love, I love doing this for you guys, so um, <clears throat> this year, I, uh, I, uh, I do have disclosures, I think the two there that are, are most relevant, really the Globus one is, a, it's absolutely relevant, because I speak and, uh, and do some consulting on robotics for them, but uh, this year I added a bunch of slides, so I'm going to try to be uh, good about my timing. I, I tend to run over sometimes, but I'll I'll fly through things that I think are less important this year and uh, focus on a few other things this year that I think are are sort of how I'm shaping out my robotics talks. For those on the call that don't know about me, I'm a comprehensive uh, academic practice in University of Kansas in Kansas City. Uh, in my training, I had no robot experience, and there was no robots uh, at HSS when I did my fellowship. But when we came back, we got one about a year into my my time here, and now I use it uh, multiple times a week. Uh, but I don't use it for every case, and there's some very specific things about why and how I use robotics um, that I'll get into. <laughs> I always have to put this in. It's uh, perfect for this group, and Hanny's on the call, so it makes sense uh, yeah. to have it here. Uh, several years ago, I was at, uh, I think it was a base to summit, right, Hanny? And, and I gave a talk, yeah, it was a so. sponsored talk by Globus about robotics and, and, it, and to be fair, that was two or three years ago and, and robotics, I think had, was just starting to get traction a little bit more than it does now, or it does, has now. And Hanny stood up at the mic and said, I don't get it, Carlson. Like, well, what is this? Isn't this just navigation? And, and he's right. It is. Uh, but I would say that it's navigation, uh, with less variation, more imaging options, more pre-planning features, and it's, uh, in my opinion, just much, much easier. So it, I tell people sort of in an offhand way, I think it's Navigation 2.0, and it has some features that I think are valuable in the operating room, but it is essentially just navigation. So really, it's interesting. I gave a talk recently at IMAST, and this this slide is actually from a, a different talk I gave at Spine Safety Summit a, year, a couple of years ago. And stereotactic spine surgery, uh, stereotactic procedures, I should say, uh, really the origins came from neurosurgery. And I think Hanny would know that uh, very clearly and some of the other people on the call, but it's now become the standard of practice or standard of care for any sort of brain uh, tumor operation. If you don't have navigation, you just don't do the operation. Uh, let's talk about robotics a little bit. And so on the left side, I have a box here that talks about just spine instrumentation evolution. You can kind of see Harrington Rod in the 70s uh, was a big, uh, huge step forward. And then in the 80s, you know, 15 years later, you got so several systems. One of them, I solo was developed in Kansas City. So I'm I'm familiar with this history because of uh, my connection to Mark Asher. But CDI, Moss, Miami, and I solo really became the uh, systems that popularized pedicle screw fixation. And since then, we really just had advancements on pedicle screw fixation. In 2023, we've got different colored screws and different company screws and a bunch of different connectors, et cetera. But by and large, it's the same type of instrumentation. It gives three-dimensional correction to the spine, et cetera. That's a pretty long evolution you can see on the left, but look at the right side. First robot introduced in 2004, and we really didn't have much advancements until the 2000. 2016, 17, 18, 19, uh, when you get these two systems, which are by and large uh, the world over the most popular system. So yes, I'm conflicted with Globus, but Medtronic and Globus really have the um, the market cornered as of 2023, 2024. And there's several platforms that are coming out that you're going to start to see some uh, variety and some competition. So uh, here's sort of a summary. The first robot in 2004, 17, 18, 19 was when the world started to picking these things up much more worldwide. A talk I gave recently at at IMAS, I, I uh, talked to the companies, Medtronic and Globus, and said, you know, how many cases have we actually done since 2016? And you can see by their estimates, we've done about 127,000 robotic cases since 2016. So the the fact is, this is not going away. It's going to increase, uh, continue to increase adoption. New surgeons are getting these. Uh, they want to use them. The expanded uses are coming. Uh, more robotic platforms will be available. And then the advancements of the robotic platforms is really going to start pushing more and more utilization. But really, like, where did this come from and who evaluates these things for safety? And that's the FDA. So I did a little back history on this when I gave my mass talk. And the FDA 
classifies robotic navigation. This kind of goes back to Hanny's comment. It is just navigation. So the classification of any navigation platform is an orthopedic stereotaxic instrument. And this is actually the little consensus standard uh, by which they, they classify these. And this goes back all the way to, you know, any sort of navigation system you've ever heard of or used like Stealth, Brain Lab, uh, a number of different striker system, et cetera. They're all under this same category. So then what are 510K submissions? Because we people mention those and just to put it out there so everybody's on the same page, 510K means that it's a substantial equivalence to something else that's pre previously uh, approved and legally U.S. marketed in um, in the F with under FDA guidelines, and so it has to have a predicate device. And these are the criteria. I won't go through them, but essentially, robotics falls under a predicate device of navigation. So, Hanny, after several years of me learning more and more and investigating and getting on FDA websites, you're right. This is just navigation, right? So hey, here are the Brandon, FDA happy approved. To do my part. <laughs> here are the you're making me a better man. Here are the FDA approval letters for the different robotic platforms that are the most popular worldwide. On the left, you have Globus, the middle is Medtronic, and the right side is Zimmer Rosa. You can see they're all the same exact classification. And so then what does that classification really mean? Well, it means this. You have a tracker on the patient, you have a tracker of the instruments, and you put stuff in the spine with 1.5 millimeter accuracy. That's all it requires. But that doesn't really capture what a robotic system actually can do for you. And so <clears throat> in my head, a robot is not what you see here. There's like this Android device in the middle that's doing surgery for us. It's certainly not a Da Vinci platform like a lot of patients think it is. And it's definitely not a surgeon. What it is, is a surgical tool. We have a lot of different surgical tools that we've utilized and developed over years. You can see like the most basic ones in the top left corner. We have power tools that help us cut things faster. We have special tables, laparoscopic uh, type procedures that help us access and do things through tiny incisions. You know, you've got arthroscopy, which is the massive step forward in uh, sports medicine surgery. And so where does this fall in our you know, sort of workload or, or uh, workflow of an operation? You can see I sort of built out this this sort of flow chart, I guess, of a, of, a, of a surgery. And really robotics still sits right here. It's implant placement, that's about it. It's gonna do more things in the future, but current state 2024, it's navigation and robotics that puts implants in. And that, that's where it sits. It doesn't do much more than that. So here we are. Dr. Lenke developed a probe to put pedicle screws in. Navigation came along uh, much earlier than robotics to help us put screws in with image guidance. And now we have robotic assistance, which is really, as I describe it to some patients, it's a fancy drill guide that helps us place screws with navigation, but as I sort of loosely call it, navigation 2.0. Here's what it really is uh, from a practical standpoint for those on the call who don't know. Uh, it's tracking plus imaging to give you sort of navigation principles. So uh, in the robotic world, this uh, flashing video here sort of demonstrates how there's uh, different ways to capture imaging. Pre-op CT merge means I'm shooting fluoro with this uh, device on the fluoroscopy, which gives fiducials and allows me to merge to the preoperative CT. And you see how that merge is occurring there. Intraoperative 3D, we're familiar with OARM, other imaging platforms. That's a Zeem. Uh, they can capture imaging in real time. And I would say that those are called, or we kind of describe them as ground truth imaging, meaning it happened on the table in the right position uh, at the time of surgery. And then after that, the robotic system allows you to pre plane screws. So you can kind of see here, you know, I want it to be right in the pedicle. I want it to go down this track and I pre plan it. And then after that, you execute the screw. So the arm comes into play uh, into the field here. It tells you where to go. The instrument itself is tracked. As you can see here, here's the tracker. Here's the fancy drill guide, as I call it. Here's the patient tracker. The execution part is the payoff for all the workflow up uh, in front of it. This process takes about 45 seconds uh, for even someone not moving very quickly. And the execution, if all the steps before it are done properly, uh, is extremely simple and, and very reproducible. So here's what it kind of looks like. I did this video a while ago. I am on the left doing a robotic case. That is a, fel a, a, a resident of mine uh, who's now in fellowship at Leatherman. Actually, yeah, he's got one more month. Uh, he's doing a navigation case. And so again, they're not apples to apples necessarily because he's putting a thoracic screw in and I'm you know, putting in a, a lumbar screw. But you can kind of tell there's a difference here, right? Like he's 
staring at the screen and kind of moving his arms around to make it look the way he wants it to versus I'm just following the path that has right in front of me. I'm swapping instruments out. Here's my screw going in and he's still tapping. Okay. Um, so again, he's doing an open case. It's not quite the same, but here we, we cut his video. Now he's going to the screw and he's done with his tap. He's going to start putting his screw in. And so sure. Would I, you know, could someone sit there and argue, okay, well, does it matter that you were 25, 30 seconds faster than him? Uh, no, probably not. I think from a safety standpoint, all that really matters is the screw getting in the right spot, but you can kind of appreciate that there's more variation for, with what he's doing. He's moving things around. He's looking again. You can see the screen's moving quite a bit. You know, it looks and feels right. Okay, great. But I didn't have to do any of that. So it takes a little bit of your mental workload down to get the same path and trajectory every single time. The robot also has a bunch of safety tools built in. So for example, this is what a screen looks like when we're doing a case. And these green boxes tell me that I'm in the proper trajectory when I'm doing the that, that specific step. There's a meter down here that tells me if things are moving, breathing movement, the camera, et cetera. I have this surveillance marker on the patient, which indicates to me whether this tracker has moved or not. And so far as I, oh, and sorry, there's a deflection meter because as you put the instrument through the arm of the robot, it will tell you if you are off trajectory or you're pushing or leaning on it, on leaning on the instrument. These things don't exist in freehand navigation. So there are advantages from a safety standpoint, in my opinion, when you've introduced a rigid robotic arm. Um, sorry, this slide. Uh, there was a there was a picture I was going to put in there from a case I did yesterday, and and uh, it had some protected health information on it. So I just deleted it. I'm sorry, but. What the picture was, was telling me that during image capture, we had a significant amount of movement of the patient and the system actually alerted me. So there's other alerts that happen at different stages of the robotic process uh, that, that can tell you when you're gonna be safe or when you're not. So when we use robotics, there's a lot of different ways to use them. And this kind of gets back, you know, now that I've shown you what it is and how it works, here's how I've been using it. So obviously MIS perk screws is the best example. Uh, this can be done navigation, fluoro, anything, right? For me, I love this because it does these tiny little incisions, which we can do in a lot of different methods, but I use two fluoro shots for this whole thing. And the entire workflow, setting it up, putting the tracker on the patient, executing the screws took 22 minutes. It's, and for me, that's a very successful workflow in the operating room. I'm good with that. I don't wear lead. There's only two fluoro shots for the whole thing. Love scenarios like that. You can instrument previous fusion masses. Again, navigation could be used for any of this where you don't have bony landmarks, dysplastic pedicles, et cetera, but it allows you to pre-plan things. So this is a, an old Harrington construct that needed an extension down to her pelvis. And as you can see in this picture up here, this has got a solid, smooth fusion mass. This was an open operation. So I exposed this smooth fusion mass, all of this smooth bone, and you really, I mean, yes, Dr. Lenke or maybe Bob Eslack could instrument that. They know like mentally, they've got so many experiences screw hand hand screw placements that they can go oh this is where the pedicle is and they can get it right but for me you know this took a lot of the stress out this tiny little dysplastic pedicle got a screw very quickly and takes a lot of the work uh, of um, maybe doing a laminectomy to feel the pedicle or anything like that out of the out of the equation here's another example uh, as we're all pretty familiar with anytime you run into like really sclerotic bone, it can deflect you and you're not really feeling the pedicle if it's freehand, similar to how you normally would think you would within a cancellous channel. But in robotics, you already see it. You already have the feedback immediately. You're just going to drill right through that and know that it's correct. Here's another great example. This is a revision case I did. A woman had an L5S1 pseudarthrosis. You can see a halo around this screw. I really didn't like how her screws were placed. They're very medialized, they're straight in, they're not very robust. And I said, gosh, couldn't I use a robot to like replan these and go around those? She's got big pedicles. And as you can see here, I went traversed right across her tract, I, you know, traversed these tracks and I didn't blow this one up, but this is what her end, ending construct looked like. I didn't even use anything close to her previous tracks. So again, the pre-planning component of this is what allowed me to do that. Here's another great example. Uh, again, previous fusion mass you see here, very dysplastic pedicle uh, on the concavity, uh, made a short order of this with a robot. SUAI screws, I think this is one of the, probably the most 
uh, easy applications. Uh, it allows for a very, uh, uh, really shorten up your distal dissection. My, my incisions have gotten shorter. I can lift up the fascia and work underneath it with the robot. Since it's a medial to lateral trajectory, it makes it very easy for the robot to reach that angle. And things like this can occur. So I wanted two screws on this for a kickstrand rod on one side. Uh, uh, once again, sort of the advantages I have here are that, yes, it requires some setup. Yes, it requires more equipment, but I did two fluoro shots. I pre-planned screws right down the, the throat of the teardrop perfectly. And at the end of that, my stress level for missing a screw or getting a good anchor distally was very, very low. So executing these screws was a pretty simple process for me. Here's what the final construct on that woman looked like. Uh, again, two fluoro shots for these, for these iliac bolts and uh, not too difficult. Here's some other examples of great S2AI screw constructs. Uh, this is just a T10 to pelvis. Uh, here's a multi-level uh, MIS deformity type case. You can see I've got like 100 millimeter screws here. Not too difficult to place those. This was a, a multiple myeloma case that I was trying to bridge across a, a fracture through the sacrum. And so four screws uh, on both sides. And that's why these uh, satellite rods are going across to the uh, other screws. Again, not very, very difficult. Uh, distal dissection is small. I didn't even have to look at the bony landmarks. You take your fluoro shots and you're navigating right away. So what about the data? A lot of studies out there uh, that seem to support robotics and navigation. You certainly can say uh, that both navigation and robotics have some advantages in terms of uh, slightly increased percentages of accuracy compared to other methodologies. Here's another couple studies, 3D nav, 95% accurate. Uh, you've got successful screw placement, 97% of uh, screws here. Here's a bunch of robotics uh, papers. Uh, improved accuracy in the robotic group compared to freehand, fewer facet joint violations. Robotics have 97.8% accuracy compared to freehand of 95%. Uh, no facet violations here. Uh, again, another one, robot versus navigation, 99% accurate robotic, 92 navigation. Here's a couple more studies, again, all emphasizing similar themes. Decreased radiation dosages in the robotic group. This is... Uh, Another one that said 70, 62% reduction in radiation, and these all seem to make sense, right? Like once you get the navigation system going, if you're going to compare it to doing fluoro-based screws, you're obviously going to have less radiation. Uh, Qureshi's published a couple different things on that in terms of radiation exposure and uh, accuracy in, um, in minimally invasive surgeries. So this is where things are going, right? A lot of these papers are, are more recent since 2022. And you can see sort of the trends and the themes that are starting to pop up in the, in the literature. Pediatric spine surgery, cervical surgery, learning curves in residency, increased pedicle screw sizes, uh, clinical outcomes, surgeon well-being and ergonomics and uh, outcomes and complications. So <clears throat> clearly because of the popularity of this this technology and people are starting to use it more and more, you're starting to see <clears throat> enough time since uh, the advent of these uh, platforms that people can start studying them with longer term results. So we're going to see more and more literature keep popping up on this, uh, myself included. I've got several papers that are uh, in different phases of writing and or submission currently that, that touch on a lot of these topics. So my current experience, uh, as of yesterday, 389 cases, uh, and I've got six aborted screws that I've had to remove intraoperatively, but I've had no neuro deficits and no returns to the OR. So here's some examples of how I adopted navigation robotics. Uh, early cases, I was doing OR spins and playing perk screws. I don't love the way that this looks I my constructs look completely different now, but I'm pretty honest and open. Like this was my third case. I was still learning how to use it. And now you start to see longer screws. You know, this is 14 cases in, but you'll see even more examples of this longer screws um, with better trajectories, in my opinion. This was the first CT merge after an interbody. Here's the 39th case, still doing O arms after A lifts. I don't necessarily do that anymore. Here's an S2AI example. Again, looking at the S2AI screws, about 10 minutes with the CT merge, place these screws, very low stress, low radiation, low distal dissection. Here's a discitis case. It was the first case I did as a single position surgery, so I wanted to place screws around a, a construct here uh, to bridge long, a uh, few short. I'd only, I've done about a year's worth of robot cases before I ever thought to attempt this. Here's what it would look like. I did this corpectomy or partial corpectomies to address his infection, but I wanted to, again, instrument long and fuse short. Here's what he looked like post-op. 
this again was done all in the same position. We didn't reposition him after the thoracotomy. Uh, my anesthesiologist was preparing for all that. And I said, no, 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 we're good. I'm just going to use this instrument over here and we're going to place some screws. So easily done. And then again, since it was uh, an instrument long, but not fusion, I pulled the screws out later. Here's some other uh, case examples, 77th case. I did the CT merge after the inner bodies were placed, which some people would suggest the metal inner bodies have a harder time with the merge. I have now been able to make that work quite well. Here's another example. Uh, again, just an L45. This was a single position lateral surgery. Uh, many people do this with fluoro base. Uh, it just makes it easy for me. You can kind of see even the ergonomics. It's not too difficult and placing good um, um, medialized screws or triangulated screws is pretty simple. I have a case today, actually. The, my second case today is this exact same surgery. Single position surgery has some uh, limits. You know, I think with anybody even doing fluoro, you got to think about uh, your bed that you're using, uh, where you're going to mark your incisions as they might slope when people lay uh, lateral. How you drape the patient, I think, is critical. Where the bed is, uh, you've got this kind of metal on certain beds, and you got to make sure that that's not in the CT merge imaging or else it'll block it. So how did I learn to kind of keep using this thing, and why do I still use it, and what what was my process? And I gave a talk at Safety Summit this year where I took the opposite approach from what I've previously done, where I've said, well, you know, I'm really, I, I've done a lot of cases. I, I've only missed six screws or seven screws or whatever it might have been. And, uh, but where did I learn all that? Well, it's been all my failures. And here's what I did. I pulled a slide out or created this slide that showed all the cases where I missed a screw, the six screws I mentioned. Uh, you can kind of see fourth case, 10th case, 75th, 118, 173, and 244. There's a couple things I take away from this. 244 cases, I still missed a screw. Well, here's why. And I learned a lot from this case. It was a pedicle fracture that was sclerotic. And it was a chronic ismic spondy uh, through basically a pedicle, not a pars fracture. And, you know, I, my theory is that the instrument deflected this fracture line and I missed the screw. I don't even love the way these screws ended up. But what I learned is that micro motion of this vertebral body, no matter how you're going to place the screw, whether it's freehand, whether it's navigation, whether it's robotics, becomes a high risk scenario. And so these are the kinds of cases now I look at with a high level of scrutiny. Here's one that was a single position lateral case. You can see I'm doing an inner body trial and I'm looking at this screw going, well, wait a minute. Why did that happen? Well, looking back at it, tiny sclerotic pedicle. It was the last screw I placed. I think that placing this screw rotated it just enough to miss that screw. And again, micro motion in the case, even intraoperatively at a segmental level, can cause a problem where something can be missed. Luckily, I've not had any neuro deficits, but these are the things that built my media library for how do I use this thing effectively now? What are the scenarios where I need to have extra attention? Things like that. So I took a chapter out of uh, Chris Ahmad's book. He actually spoke at the Safety Summit last year. And when he when he gave his talk, I was sitting there, my mind was being blown because I'm like, wow, this is something I need to do. I need to unpack what I do with robotics to figure out how to teach this to people. And so what I did is I said, you know what? One of the things he talked about was people watch a lot of tape. He gives a great example talking about his son, who's a chess player. Uh, but I started thinking about, you know what? Athletes do this all the time. Like, obviously, you guys know Pat Mahomes, world champion right here. He watches film. As soon as he does a play, he watches film. You got golfers do the same thing. Uh, it's always done in professional sports. And here's the Blue Angels in the top right. What do they do? They're watching film. So I did that put cameras up in my OR, recorded my OR. I watched my own film. You can see this is me putting the, the GoPro on the wall as I'm going to do this case. And I was thinking, I got to figure out what are the things I'm doing during a case that make me so successful with a robot that I need to be able to unpack that and try to teach it to someone. This is the, the list of steps. I watch my video and I write down, what did I do? This is the list of steps that I did in one case. One case to make sure I stayed accurate, stayed safe, and I got the screws executed appropriately. And there's a lot more here than what the industry, you know, the, the companies are going to teach you about robots. This is not just simple navigation. There's a lot of things happening here. So I came out uh, the Safety Summit this year and gave this talk and said, here are my top three things I pulled away from this. Number one, planning. Planning is huge. It all, everything. Room setup, how you prep and drape, where your instruments are, how your uh, uh, assistants, where they stand, what you're doing. But then you go to the, the robot. The robot gives you this next step that's different than navigation where you get to plan things. So this picture is the something I developed which shows you like skive potential. When the robot comes in, if you're going to put it 
instrument down, there's a high sky potential on a sloped uh, entry point. So you want to plan your screws appropriately to have a safe entry point. That can be one thing that could lead you to success. You know, but body habitus, the whether you're doing thoracic screws or lumbar screws, these have different different scenarios that you need to think about or I think about that that make me um, have high risk or low risk scenarios with placing instruments and placing screws. Um, and so planning has really become one of the mainstays that I think about how the room is all set up, everything. It all leads up to the screw execution. Motion. I usually, I, I initially did not appreciate motion and how critical it is to navigation at all. Navigation, robotics, all of them are affected by this. There are so many sources of motion in the operating room, patient, mechanical ventilation, us, uh, the spine itself moving in a traumatic situation, the different pathologies we're dealing with, equipment like bear huggers and Neptunes and sea arms. Uh, the Neptune sitting next to the camera, it creates motion on the floor. It vibrates and it makes the camera have the, the camera that's the tracking camera has inaccuracy. I never knew any of this stuff. You can see it down here. This is a case from this weekend. We had the fluoro moving quite a bit, and that moving caused a registration failure. And so the robotic system told me that. But if I didn't have a robotic system to tell me, I might not know that. So all I do now is I'm thinking uh, during the case and during every procedure, I'm thinking about all the sources of motion, trying to decrease them. So here's a great example. This is a trauma I did. I'm sorry, this is a tumor I did. Highly unstable scenario, metastatic breast cancer. And a lot of people would put one tracker on, whether it was on the pelvis or distal, and place all these screws. And I don't do that anymore. I've had a, a I had a scenario where um, we had a registration error, and I was trying to figure out why. And it's because the spine moves, and that movement right there in the middle of the construct is going to create inaccuracies after you place these screws for these screws. And so what I do now is I put a tracker above it. I place those screws and I put a tracker below it to place these screws. And so those two uh, scenarios where I have separate merges or separate calibrations for the different screws has, a, has allowed me to be very, very successful, even in highly unstable spine situations. Lesson three was failure scenario identification. I kind of picked this up from my brother. He's a pilot. He does, um, he flies commercial planes now, but he flew F-18s. And when you fly a plane or you're you're at a jet level, you have to do something each year called a type rating. And the type rating is basically a set set or there's a big set of failure scenarios in a, in a plane. So when you're flying along, the hydraulics go out. What do you do? Well, we don't do that a lot in spine. Uh, there are some scenarios where we teach that, but it's not really prevalent yet in robotics. And what I figured out is I have a really good media library of failure scenarios. So as you do more and more cases, just like I showed, even up to my 244th case, I'm building that set of scenarios where I'm going, yeah, this one might have a high risk for failure or a misplaced screw. You know, failure doesn't always equal neurologic deficit and death, but missing a screw, you could think, oh man, that's going to impact my construct. So now that I look for all these different ways that the things can fail or these scenarios where the risk for failure is higher, I start to have different acuity for different cases. It also gives me this sense of when does it look or feel wrong? And those scenarios is when I'll stop and slow down and maybe make sure I need to reset. So this is something critical that I think only comes with experience. So why do I still use it? I got about a minute left. I'll fly through these things. I think it's accurate, safe, and easy, uh, but only after you've learned how to use it appropriately. The CT merge for me reduces radiation quite a bit, and I think it's very accurate. It's given me a tool that allows me to do other things that I didn't necessarily know how to do before. They're calling me from the OR, sorry. Um, um, Image guided surgery and robotic platforms continue to evolve. And again, I, I think the adoption is coming even more so than it already has. And as the platforms evolve, we're going to see more and more people use it. Here's great examples. Again, these are recent, more recent cases. I think this was in my talk last year, but I'm using it for a lot of different reasons, a lot of MIS surgery. And I get screws that look like this very, very commonly, very routinely. In my hands, I'm looking at like, I want my screws to look perfect. I want them to almost look like one screw at each case. I want them to be long and large diameter to have good fixation to bone that maybe isn't otherwise good. And here's a great, another great example. Two fluoro shots, 19 minutes, 7545s. As I said before in that first early on slide, you know, my constructs look different now than when I first used it. Here's a great example. And Bob, this is the case I was talking about. I did a discitis case this weekend. T89 discitis. Uh, it really didn't have complete bony destruction above uh, the level of the pedicle at T8, but a lot of the bodies had to be removed. So we did a 
uh, thoracotomy. I did it with cardiothoracic surgery Saturday morning. I did this uh, corpectomy or hemicorpectomy, whatever you want to say, put that expandable cage in to address the infection. But then I really didn't want to do the, the typical two above, two below. I do like having at least on one side some rotational control or having a cross connector on a construct with only four screws for rotational control with a corpectomy. But here's what the robot gave me such a powerful position. This tiny little slice of bone that I had left was at the level of the pedicle. I said, well, geez, I could probably sneak a screw in there. And here you go with a perfect x-ray afterwards. These screws look awesome. Now, granted, these are tiny screws, but again, I'm only using them for rotational control. Here's the post spin uh, uh, screw placements. You can see they're all perfectly placed. And for me, this is a this is an advantage. This tool made this so easy on a Saturday with the, the weekend crew that we all know isn't always the best crew. But the tool, once it's in my hands, I can make it work for me. So here's the last uh, uh, slides. Um, I've got, you know, cases here where I've uh, have residents that train with me and I can stand behind them and I can be confident that they're going to place a screw in, even if they're not uh, fellows or fellow level. Here's a resident putting a screw in single position lateral while I'm watching and making sure it's done safely. But I don't know that I could teach a second year resident how to do fluoro based lateral screws and be confident they're going to be in the right spot. Um, this is a little work clothes tips for success. I won't go all the way through it. Again, it's all about understanding the rules of navigation, understanding it's a surgical tool and respecting that. And uh, future directions, I think there's going to be a lot more research on this, whether it's cost effective or not. It's very expensive capital. I haven't addressed that, but I think that the, the amount of capital we use for a lot of other things and how that's going to allow us to play screws safely. That's the tip of the iceberg. I think there's going to be a lot more coming in terms of real-time segmental tracking, how the arms move. They'll be faster uh, navigation without ionizing radiation, maybe MRI or ultrasound. There's a lot coming. Lastly, uh, keep Dr. Burton in your in your uh, thoughts. He's doing great. I mentioned this last year. Um, he's about 18 months in with a glioblastoma. Many of you know him. Uh, he's doing awesome. But um, all the positive vibes going his way. Here's uh, here's Greg came in town to have some steaks for them. So uh, with that, I'll go ahead and stop. I know I'm a couple minutes over. I apologize. Thanks, Brandon. That was awesome. Yeah, thanks, bud. I mean, um, Brandon, speaking frankly, and I'll turn over to Bob, I think it was a great talk. And, and a big part of the reason is just how, like, forthright. It, it doesn't seem like you're somebody, like, oftentimes when you go to the meetings, you, you can kind of feel the conflict um, from some of the speakers. I think yours, you know, both in terms of the positive and the negative, it, it's just very um, sober. And that's sort of, I think, what we need in people that are in your position are sort of champions of robotics. So... I really appreciate it. And likewise, the deep dive, the film review, like the iterative step thing. I mean, that's that's all the type of stuff that I think we need to make robotics even more important in our field. So I, I really appreciate it, man. Yeah, that means a lot. I, You know, when I gave the Safety Summit talk last year, uh, I got a lot of criticism actually from Dr. Lanky. And I can be pretty honest about it because it's recorded. Uh, and uh, the new, the one from this year is recorded as well. And and he highlighted that, you know, and I'm a young surgeon, obviously younger than him. And, and I don't have the, the tenure that he has to stand up there and say, well, here's how I've had all that, my problems. And, and I'm, I'm taking pause with that now. Like I do have sort of the experience level now more so than maybe many that I can say those things. And so this year I flipped it over and I gave that scenario. I, I talked about all my failures, talked about all the ways that I, I've learned that this can be exploited in a bad way. Many of these, I hope, are addressed with technology advancements. The next iterations of robots will prevent some of these things, you know. Um, but it it it's become very apparent to me that the more you bring that out and say things in, a, in an open way, I was even on a, a the safety summit had a a robotics best practice guideline working group, and the group of us we were very candid with each other, and it was interesting because the whole room was learning from each other things that we. Everyone thinks, you know, they're all experts yeah. on robotics, but we're all learning things like, I didn't know that, you know, and, and they're yeah. le learning things from me. So my plan is to write some of that up um, in, in hopefully a candid and appropriate and meaningful, teachable way. Uh, some of those uh, those cases I have, I believe I've figured out why I had my failure in those scenarios. And I think teaching those lessons can help people have a lot less of those uh, scenarios. A hundred percent. And just the tone of it being like, yeah, it is navigation. But here's why I still think it's valuable as opposed to like I, I, you were at Think Tank. This or, or what it's called um, state of spine this past week. And there was a similar talk and it was just kind of gassing robots. 
And I think for somebody like me who's got a little bit of skepticism when it's just pure gas, like you, you tend to tune out. Whereas when yeah. it's more honest and forthright, you're like, okay. And you actually, paradoxically, I think see the value more. Because yeah. So anyways, I appreciate it, man. Yeah. Hey, hey Brandon, uh, Jamie Bruffy here. I just got to tell you too, this talk also teaches our fellows and once again reemphasizes to me the need to be very critical of every step we take in the operating room. It is so important to think about what we are actually doing. And I, I, I applaud you for how focused you are and analyzing what you are doing in the operating room to make it better. So yeah. kudos, man. Kudos. Appreci yeah, appreciate that. And that, you know, it's interesting. There's someone who gave a talk a few years ago and they they wanted to highlight or they they believe you know robotics decreases your cognitive load. And I was like, you know, that I don't know if that's actually true. And it took me about a year and talking to Phil Louie and we were talking about something else. It shifts your cognitive load. So the screw execution, again, is the payoff. That's the simple part. That's what everybody wants to highlight is the aha of robotics. But really, the cognitive load happens in the setup, the calibration, and all of those things that I put in that list of that video. And that's what you're talking about, uh, Jamie, is like, if you don't think about those things, you're missing it. And that's where that's where issues happen, where people exploit this technology and do something wrong. And the hyper analysis of all the steps leading up to that makes it so that, ah, oh, when I put the screw in, it's easy. But when you put a screw in and it's wrong and then you're like, wait, wait, what's going on? You can't blame the tool. You have to go back and look yeah, at well, where did that where did that flaw happen? Yeah, right. Your 19 minute operating times are not including your 30 minutes of that prep. So, no, that includes so, that includes my prep, that uh, my times yeah. that I give in my but but you're right. And my my early cases, my setup prep and screw execution was an hour and people that don't want to go through a learning curve of learning like, oh, gosh, this has a different setup than navigation. This is I, I don't understand this arm coming in here. What you know that it's there's time that you have to learn. And then that time chips down as you do more and more cases. But it's all that setup that matters, in my opinion. So agree. So agree. Brandon, do you do you feel like the segmental registration has gotten to a, a pretty refined place? In On the CT merge? After, after inner bodies? Yeah. So yes. you're, yeah. So you're not doing spins in the OR. Yeah, I wanted to ask the hassle. same question. Yeah, if, yeah you can, if you can punt on image acquisition in the OR, that is a massive step forward. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and um, so probably for last three years, I don't spin in the OR at all. And I've got a project in works here, and I'll just be brief, where I'm looking at radiation exposures from all different methods. So pre-op CT, how much is that to the patient? How much is an intraoperative spin? How much to the surgeon and the patient? Versus like pre-op CT plus fluoro shots, as I keep showing, how does that how does that equate to radiation for both surgeon and patient? I think the merge algorithm has become so good, at least on the Globus platform, that I I am very trusting of it. And I don't have experience with Medtronic. There might be Medtronic users on here who want to chime in. I'm totally because I think. All the companies are pushing that forward. They need to get better and better and better. The Globus system, about two years ago, they added a feature where you tell it it has hardware that you added that are that's different from your pre-op scan. So it even refines it more when it knows there's inner bodies in there. And it's tight. Like I have very few issues where there's a lot of shift. That's what you see in the calibration problems is a lot of shift. If there was a shift, what I found is it's because the CR moved or you've got a bear hugger running or they were running SSCPs while you were taking your pictures or your mechanical ventilation was, you know, your, your tidal volumes are 500, which means that the, the tracking device is moving up and down during your pictures. All of those things will cause shift, but the algorithm itself will find the spine extremely well. Um, so uh, another question is about, you know, the whole planning thing, because I think where I see currently the robotics being better than nav is you you go straight to trajectory depth everything's kind of set for you theoretically you could do that with nav whereas most of us are kind of looking up at a screen trying to find our path they're not always set up uh, ultimately well uh, if you're doing long constructs or things like that in terms of location so you could do that with nav do you think that it's worth the incremental cost you know you're probably talking about two, three thousand bucks 
amortized at least per patient versus just doing the planning and using NAV rather than robotics in its current state I and, and not talking about the new stuff that'll be coming. I, I don't I don't know. I mean, yes, the companies that made these first iterations of robots, uh, really this is kind of Gen 2, the two platforms that are out now because um, um, you know, Mazor had an, an iteration change. And, and so the current ones that are out there, I mean, I think it's pretty reasonable to describe that the, the companies are currently using these platforms to get their ROI, right? They, they put a ton of R and D into these things and now they're trying to sell, 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 sell with a planned obsolescence of probably five years is my guess. I don't know. They're probably going to come out with new versions within the next two to three to four years and then everybody's going to have to upgrade right well that happened i mean that happened with yeah. orm one right right so yeah these ones are egregiously expensive and i don't know i you know you and i had just at uh, cabo we were talking about like how a hospital views that and i think that could be a whole lecture on its own is the cost yeah. effectiveness of a, of a technology like this you know and and hanny might be able to chime in about like well, when they buy an arrow, which is an interoperative CT, because that's the standard of care for brain tumors, how much yeah. is that thing versus how much the tumor surgery, you know, and, and I don't know. We're not there yet where we're going to say robotics is the standard of care for placing a screw in the spine. It's just not there. Or, uh, yeah. Maybe we will be in the next five years when the tracking and the ability to exploit errors becomes zero. I don't know. Um, but we're not there. And so right now, yeah, there's a big disconnect, at least in the U.S., that the machine is so dang expensive for what we're actually achieving with it. And I think that's what you're kind of getting at is like if I can plan yeah. with navigation and use a cheaper system or maybe AR, augmentics, or any of the heads up display, like they, they can kind of achieve the same thing. I, I think you're right. You're spot on. I jumped into this because I think that there is something here in the next five, 10 years. And I think the next generations of these robots will really blow people's minds. And when we get to that point, I'm, I really wanted to be part of the group that helped get it there or learned about it early on and not just a late adopter. Um, and I would hope that the companies will find a way to make it more cost uh, neutral or maybe cost, right, right. I, I don't know, so that more people can have access to this. Totally agree. I, 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 I think we'll benefit approach. from yeah. from from a uh, multiple process uh, iteration as well. You know, right now it's sort of singular, um, but there are already already um, robotic systems that have multiple arms. They can be doing multiple things at once. I think that's yep. that'll give us a huge leap forward in its capability yep. and added value. Well. I, you got to get to the OR. Thanks for yeah. uh, being with us again. Of course. You're awesome. the man, Brandon. Ah, Annie, that's not true. I appreciate the time. Again, the invitation means so much to me, and I, I love you guys so much. And and SDSF is just is is always been something I've admired. Uh, once again, I can't say enough good things about it. I don't know if uh, Dr. A is on, but I always like to say hi and 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 thanks for his guidance and his mentorship to me uh, in the past. So. Um, hope you guys have a great day. My email was on there. Bob or Hanny can share. If anyone ever has questions or wants a phone call, I can talk about this a lot, obviously, and I try to be open and candid. So please reach out anytime. Thanks, Brandon. Go Bill. Have a great Thank you, Brandon.